Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Everybody's slightly tired. Uh, let's see where we can take this. Um, so I want to talk about building distributed systems and distributed teams and mainly stress on the team side. Um, so let's see. Who is working from home here? It's kind of hard to see, but OK, that's only a few. Who is working from a co-working space or some shared thing which you're organizing yourself? That's very few. Um, who is working from an office? That's the majority. OK. Um, whenever I hear office or especially open plan office, this is my association, uh, that this is what you have to wear to make it work and not shout around everybody else. Um, so who has this? I can work from home for one day a week, preferred on Fridays. Yes. Is it the slacking off day? Because oftentimes I see that, um, at least I'm from Austria, at least in Austria it's oftentimes like, yeah, we know you do proper work for four days, Monday to Thursday, and Friday is the home office day, we know you will take it easy, um, you won't do much work, but it's kind of like a goodie that you get. Um, which I find super weird because I work in a company where we're always working from home, and I can tell you being at home is not the slacking off day. Um, so I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logsearch, Kibana, Beats. Um, I'm a developer advocate, so I mainly talk about the good stuff that we do. And today I want to focus on like the team side and how we work as a rather large company by now, uh, which is fully distributed. So by the way, this, our logo, is not a flower, because oftentimes people think this is a flower. This is a cluster, like our software that is clustered. And we also say this is unstructured, distributed, diverse. This is pretty much not only our software, but also the company that we have and the people. So that's why we have this logo. Um, if you have any questions, by the way, I normally use Slido. So if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, just head over to slido.do slash my Twitter handle, ask any questions. If we have time at the end, I will answer them. Otherwise, I will tweet out the answers. So that's the only thing to remember. Don't be shy. If you don't want to ask at the end or we run out of time, just ask there, and I will get back to you. Um, so by now, we are a company of around 900, though it's very hard to keep track because we get emails mainly on Monday. So Monday morning, you get a batch of emails like, these people have joined the company, and it's sometimes like 20 people. Um, surprisingly, I'm still the only Philip, and I'm strongly against hiring any other Philips, so we don't have any naming collisions. Um, and surprisingly, we have managed so far. We have like, lots of names. I would have never expected that we have five of those. Um, but yeah, luckily, Philip is unique so far. Um, and why elasticians? This was actually something we discussed internally. So our CEO, Shai, who also started Elasticsearch, he once kicked this off and said, like, hey, what do we call ourselves? Like, every, every company calls themselves something. You know, Google, they call themselves the Googlers, and everybody has something. And we had a vote internally and discussed that, and people came up with great ideas. Um, so, for example, the, the Elastic Comrades was one of the, the highlights, I guess. Um, we didn't pick that one. Uh, we also uh, found the Elasketeers. Um, which might make sense here, and you can see our logo is in there as well. Um, and people came up with lots of creative ideas. Um, so I really like the Homo Elasticus. Um, but yeah, there are a, a few great things in there, the Elastic Dudes, the Dads. Um, those were all creative ideas. Um, that's what we do as a company. You, that was probably an email thread of 100 emails or so. Uh, in the end, we decided on Elasticians. Um, we could have gone a bit more creative, I guess. Um, by now, we have something like this. Um, I hope this is up to date, but it's very hard to keep track of who is where and doing what. Uh, but generally, we have a lot of countries, languages, time zones, and we even have offices. But offices are mainly sales and marketing. If you happen to be in a city where we have an office, you can go. For example, in Berlin, we have a small engineering office, and I think we have like 15 people in Berlin, and four go to the office. Because the others say like, oh, I like working from home, or the commute is too far, or I don't like the weather today. So it's like two to four people normally in the office, but that's totally fine. And you're pretty much trusted wherever you are and whatever you do, you will do the right thing. So asses in seats is not a metric that we have, which a lot of other uh, companies do. Um, and we are kind of distributed by design because oftentimes people ask like, okay, we have like this centralized office. How do we get to a fully distributed company? And that is probably hard for us. It's pretty much in the company DNA because these are our four founders. And even they were not in the same city. 
So um, Simon, which is the second from the right, he was always in Berlin, while um, Shai, Steven, and Uri on the right-hand side, they were in Amsterdam. So even the four founders were not in the same city. And that what got started that everything that was being done and decided on was always in writing or via video chat. But there was never this, let's go for a coffee, let's decide on something, um, and afterwards tell everybody what has been happening. It was always like more of an open process that was kind of, available from anywhere. Um, what doesn't work that well is if you have like 70% of the people in one place and then a few satellites because they are often not really included in the decision-making process and that can be very painful. For us, since we have always been distributed and are working on keeping everything distributed, that is working very well. Um, we also like the term distributed and not remote because for us remote always implies you have like some central place and then you have like remote people around that. We don't really have this central place, at least not for engineering. Uh, we have our main office in Mountain View in the US, or at least the, for, for the US, that's the main office. Amsterdam would be the, the European equivalent. Uh, we have like our CEO and some of the VPs uh, we have there. So the decision-making process is maybe slightly tilted towards that one, but engineering is really everywhere. Like most of the teams are split across continents, and we see that as a feature. Um, to onboard, we have something we call X-School. So previously, we were using a lot of um, the X-Men terms. We, we have kept X-School, and X-School is basically when you join the company to get into the feeling, who are the people, what are we doing, how do you collaborate, we will get everybody to Mountain View, where we have the biggest office, um, and on, onboard everybody, which is, I think, like every month or every six weeks by now. And it looks something like this. So this was a few months ago, and this is like, I don't know, 120 people or so that we were onboarding uh, for one or two months. Um, so that's kind of like a large group to get started with. Um, we always have another concept that makes it more like or easier to interact, which is called always on. So when I joined the company for the very first time and I was sitting at home and I was like, okay, what do I do now? And somebody said, come on AON. And at first I didn't know what AON is. And then they told me, oh, it's called always on. So every team has a video chat and you can just join the video chat or video room. Um, everybody is muted, but you see everybody else working. And it's kind of like gives you the sense that, oh, other people are there and doing stuff. And when you have a question, you can just ping somebody and then do a quick call with them just to keep the interaction pretty much as if you were walking up to their desk and ask them something. Um, and we keep that. Some teams are very strong on that, that they're always on that video chat. Um, just don't pick your nose or do anything else because it's always on video. Um, but it's kind of seeing that your colleagues are doing stuff and everybody is working on a common goal. Um, we have a lot of cross-team time as well. So, for example, once a week we have bug pool. Bug pool is that our support people will tell the engineers, this is the stuff that we see that is breaking. This is what is a pain for us. And our engineers often say that the support team is one of their main customers because they see everything that is breaking and they see what is, are the pain points. And those are the things that we want to fix. So this is kind of like... Support is preparing, these were the worst issues, or these were issues that we're seeing more often. And then they will be discussed, and then engineering will take the right steps for that. We have something called Fix It Friday. For example, Elasticsearch now has, I don't know, 1,200 or something like that open issues, um, and that, that doesn't grow more and more, we'll have Fix It Friday, where basically everybody will get together on Friday, um, they will go through the issues that we have, and then either decide, okay, this needs to move forward, somebody needs to pick this up, we can close this because it's no longer relevant or we don't want to do that, um, or we'll need to wait a bit longer for a good decision. But every Friday, for example, the Elasticsearch team is getting together to work on things that have accumulated over the week. Some teams also have office hours, like once a week or every two weeks. They have like one or two hours where they're available on a video chat and anybody who has questions about, for example, a new product um, can ask and just get, get up to speed. Um, so you don't have to actively go somewhere and say, hey, please, can you make time on your calendar to talk to me? But you know, okay, this is the office hour when people are available and then you just show up with your questions and you'll probably get good answers. Um, we also have release parties. So whenever we release the software, we do a party which looks something like this. Um, this is the product manager for Kibana, as you can tell. Um, however, it's kind of slightly weird with these distributed parties because everybody gets a bottle of whatever favorite drink you have, and then it's like 10 minutes of party, and afterwards everybody goes back to work. It doesn't go that wild because like, drinking on your own at home uh, is kind of not as much fun as being in the office, admittedly. Um, but we do celebrate when we have a big release and it can look something like this. Um, 
I often get asked, like, what is your process? Do you do agile? Do you do daily stand-ups? What is your process? For us, we don't have much of a process. Every team figures out what is right for them. So some teams have this, like, we, we have a weekly call or we have a week, twice a week, and you try to figure out the good time zone for that. Other teams don't really do that. Um, so it's really up to the team, whatever you think makes sense um, to push you forward. We're not very strong on any process, and I guess with the people that we have, most of them hate process, so this is also a feature. Um, we have two events, um, so we have separated engineering and sales, because well, engineers often don't like sales that much. Um, so twice a week, we have, uh, twice a year, we have the engineering all hands, where basically all the engineers get together. Normally, it's in the US in spring and in Europe in fall. Everybody gets together for a week to discuss, like, both within the team, what are we doing, what are the main focuses, and also what is, like, being done or what is important across teams. And then you always have fun times. So normally we go play soccer together and then do something like paintball, go-karting, or whatever. The sales team has also an event which is called the sales kickoff aligned with the fiscal year and then they will um, do the, the sales thing. So basically everybody has to show off how much they sold and who got the biggest deal and um, it's, it's kind of a different vibe. I've joined once and it's um, different. Um, this is uh, what the, it was last fall in Berlin, our engineering all hands. Um, I'm up, up here, I think this is me. Um, but yeah, we're, we're probably 50% more uh, this fall again. So this is a lot of engineers by now. Um, values. What are the values that we have as a company? Um, we even have that online, so it's uh, called our constitution. Our constitution is basically where you can see um, what are things that we believe in and that we kind of will always get back to. So for example, for the tech size, um, we, have, we believe very strongly in progress over perfection. So you don't wait until you have the perfect feature or tool. Sometimes you just need to start something and somewhere, um, which doesn't mean just release any crap, but it is like you start somewhere even if you don't know all the details of how stuff might work out, and then you keep iterating over that and keep improving. For example, defaults are very hard, and sometimes we're getting defaults wrong. And we're sorry for that, but that's kind of the iterative nature that we have. We start with something that we think that is kind of like the right approach. After some time, it turns out, well, it's good or bad. If it's bad, we'll adjust. Um, progress is important. Keep moving. Um, that is also a very obvious one. Design for today, use abstractions with care. Um, I guess everybody hears that and agrees very strongly, and then nobody does it. Um, but we, we also have that, that sometimes people have like all these great ideas, oh, we could do this and this could be added. And then you have a very complex system and at the end it's like, okay, what do we need to fix this task or solve this one task? So this is what we're all often coming back to, especially when decisions drag and like design process get very complicated. Uh, then we're really refocusing on, okay, what do we need for this specific problem that we want to solve here? Um, Building features in isolation often means sometimes when you get started, you want something as a plugin um, and not merge it into core. Because figuring out, okay, this was not a good idea, getting rid of the plugin afterwards is much easier than having to remove code from core. And as it turns out, and probably everybody knows, removing code once it is in your product is a very hard thing. Um, however, we have this approach, remove first, fix later. Um, which sometimes causes a lot of pain for people. For example, something, if you have used Elasticsearch in very early versions, like we allowed dots in field names up until the very last version of the one branch, which was 1.7. You could use dots in field names. However, the implementation was kind of broken because we couldn't really make the determination, is this a dot in a field name or is this a sub-document uh, with the dot? And it was just broken and we... We, we didn't store it correctly to make that distinction. And then we basically removed the feature. And a lot of people were not happy because suddenly they had to change all their documents because, well, no dots are allowed anymore. We re-added dots later on with the proper implementation in 2.4, where you could optionally enable it. And it, since 5, it has been back in the main line or like enabled by default. But this is one of the examples where we remove something that we see that is causing pain and is just a problem. And we might not have a replacement because oftentimes what you do is you say, okay, we see, we know this is broken, we know this causes problems, but we cannot take away that feature. We need to replace it. And often that replacement is more complicated than you think and drags. And then you keep something that is broken. We will kick out broken stuff as soon as possible 
and we'll replace it again as soon as possible, um, which we admit will cause you pain, but we still think we should get rid of broken features as soon as possible. Um, if you disagree, come to me afterwards and we can discuss. Uh, but yeah, this is why sometimes we have ugly breaking changes, but it's kind of for the greater vision to get a better product overall. Um, something that people get sometimes very frustrated with is that we will only accept features that scale. Um, so we have that people drop a, ma a massive pull request on our code base, um, which itself is something to be careful. Um, always ask and discuss if something makes sense first. Don't throw in 20,000 lines of pull requests because A, nobody can review that, and B, maybe we don't like the feature. We had, for example, a feature to have distributed joins, which would work, or we don't have that. We, did, we never merged it. But somebody uh, did a pull request for distributed joins, and distributed joins are just a problem because they don't work well. Um, and we looked at it and we said, okay, it's nice. If you have like three nodes and not that much data, it works nicely. But if you have 100 nodes and lots more data, this will just blow up and there is no way to make that scale. So in the end, we never merged that. And people got very frustrated because they said, oh, we did all this work and it's working for my use case and it's really helping me. Why not just merge it and say, oh, this doesn't scale. Um, but for us, this is kind of a core feature. Everything that we merge has to scale. Um, Fast by default, slow is optional. So everything needs to work quickly. Otherwise, it's again not going in. This is another core principle. If you have like a very fancy and cool feature, it's just slow, um, there's not a great chance that it, this will happen in our products. Um, People-wise, kind of the number one thing is probably be kind. It's like always expect that people are doing the right thing um, and then show them empathy and try to help out, especially when you onboard somebody or somebody gets confused by something. It's kindness is kind of the number one thing that makes a difference. Um, sometimes discussions get very heated. Um, generally have empathy for those. So if somebody has like a very strong opinion on a feature and you have a different very strong opinions, you will need to find a common ground. And at some point you will also need to move on. Um, and always remember, people don't do that out of malice. They just have like a different view or a different experience or see that differently. Um, you can discuss, don't fight, uh, and don't hold it against anybody for having a, an opinion that you think is wrong because that just happens. Um, and it's good that everybody has a passion for what they're doing. Sometimes you have colliding passions and then you need to work around that. For example, one of the passions uh, was like, what should be the default number of shards that we have in an index? And we've had that for a long time, that it's five, which is also not great because it's a prime number and we, you could shrink stuff down, but only to a factor. And well, the only factor from the prime number is one. Um, and we've had discussions for the number of primary shards for, I don't know, two, three years. And there is no good solution. Like some people say it should be two because two is, it's still distributed, um, but it can be scaled down to one easily and it can be scaled up easily. Others are like, no, three is the right answer. Others are like, no, five. Um, does anybody know what will be the new number of default charts that we will add in in seven? Because we're changing that after years and years and years. It will be one. Um, because most people have too many charts. Um, but yeah, this was one of the things where people got very tired because they had these heated discussions like over and over again. But in the end, everybody just has a passion to do the right thing. And even if you're disagreeing, um, you need to accept that. Um, what we don't really accept is abusive comments. So if somebody is not doing the right thing, uh, some people have left the company because of that. Because it's just like there was no good way out of that. If you're telling somebody, oh, all the features that you're doing are shit, um, this is not a very productive way to go forward. And at some point, either the person abusing others will leave um, or the abused people will leave. And normally we try not to like, let the receiving end leave. Um, and we also have recently added something called, we call it our source code. Other companies would call it their company DNA. Um, for us, we, we call it source code, which looks something like this. Um, so we, we know that people have families and people have passions and they want to spend their time like with their kids or whatever they love. So um, that is something we value. Even though we have all these time zones, if you have family dinner, it's family dinner. You're not expected to make it be in a call then. Um, it's just about priorities. Um, there was this very nice tweet. Uh, I, I think it was Christmas um, of last Christmas where somebody tweeted, oh, um, 
you can have these extra two weeks between Christmas and then the new year. Um, so you have these two extra weeks and most of the companies shut down and don't do any work. Whereas if you keep working, um, you're basically getting 3.8 more time out of the year. And Usain Bolt, he won by 1.2% to make him faster. So these two weeks are basically a gift. Everybody should get back to work. Um, who agrees with that? One, two, three. Okay, um, few. Um, one of our co-founders basically um, replied, um, this is not the right way, at least for us, because we would rather be 6% uh, behind and everybody is healthy and can continue doing work in the long run than squeeze out people too much. Of course, there are sometimes sprints and you need to do a lot of work, but you cannot constantly squeeze. Like if you have worked the entire year, um, squeezing these two extra weeks, um, yeah, you're putting in more time, but how much more um, value are you really getting out of that? Um, and... This might mean not be that great for Europeans, but for Americans, this is kind of a really eye-opening feature, is that if you have a new child, you will get 16 weeks of paid vacations, um, both father or mom, um, which for the US is kind of like a brand new concept. I'm not sure if that makes our company normal or um, just the America kind of weird, but that is how we handle that. Um, but for European standards, that's kind of like the thing you would expect anyway. Um, space time. We've added this space time con uh, concept now that um, once a quarter you have a week to work on anything that you think makes sense. This is kind of your time to experiment. It's just like you have this uh, crazy idea for implementing something. Like, I don't know, you think that Kotlin will be a great fit for some specific component and you want to try that out for a week. Then you can just say, okay, this week I'm not doing any real work. Um, I'm using my space time. I'm just working on an experiment. And some of these experiments people started turned out into great products or um, fixes or solutions that we have added. So this is explicitly a feature that you can take time off to work on something that has been always itching you and been an issue for you. Um, the favorite answer of every consultant and everybody who does complicated things, it always, it depends. Um, and it's also something that we will very often say, like, um, if you ask us, like, um, what is the right number of shards for an index, we will say it depends, and then we will have a longer discussion. Um, and it's just, um, it depends not only for technical things, but only for people things, that sometimes the same thing doesn't work for everybody, and you need to find the right solution. Um, and then, as you are, it's pretty much, you need to accept that cultures are different, um, people are different, uh, you just need to work together on kind of pushing the right way forward. Because, for example, if you make a joke that is working very well in Poland, um, maybe in Japan nobody understands it, and in the US it could be very offensive, or any other way around. Um, and you just need to be aware of that, that, well, people are different, and you need to kind of make the most out of that. Um, my personal experience is... Um, Trust is one of the main things. So, for example, the day I joined, I was made an admin of our GitHub organization, um, which I was not really sure if that was a great idea, um, but that is what we did. Um, by now, we are so large and um, we're getting a bit more enterprisey. Uh, by now, not everybody is getting uh, ad GitHub admin rights anymore. And I think somebody once accidentally killed the Elasticsearch repository. Um, because it's only two clicks away. They, they thought, um, well, it's my private clone, they killed it, and then the Elasticsearch repository was gone. But GitHub can restore that, don't worry. Um, it, because, well, everybody has a source code, but suddenly the issues were gone. And somebody asked, like, maybe this is a feature that all the issues are gone. Um, and we kind of, like, can start with a clean slate. Uh, but that's not really the goal. Um, the main downside was that... Um, Consistency, uh, if you do the restore, is not always given, and especially the forks are then attributed to some weird other repository since the core repo was gone. Like, all the other forks were then uh, lined up or kind of like having an origin uh, of some other repository. Um, doing the right thing is something that my manager always tells me. Like, whenever you, you ask, like, should I do this or should I do that, he always says, like, well, figure out what is the right thing for you and the company and then just do it. That includes, for example, expenses. It's like, okay, do I need to spend that much money on this? Um, and then it's always like, does that make sense? You figure it out. Um, there always was, um, I think it was this week, um, this tweet which made the rounds where people were saying like, at GitHub, I think people got a company credit card and could just spend money. And in the end, it was cheaper that somebody was overspending or doing the, the wrong stuff than having everybody check and ask for approval. 
that something like the majority of people will intuitively do the right thing. And you just need to let them go wild to make the most out of that. Um, sometimes you volunteer like new features or something that needs to be done. Um, however, sometimes you are being voluntold um, because not everything can be fancy. For example, if you need to do some refactoring, for example, we are getting or we have been using Yoda time for a long time in Elasticsearch, um, which only gives you millisecond precision. But for some use cases, nanosecond precision would be nice. So somebody now has to refactor out Yoda time to get the JDK 8 time API in there, which will then support nanosecond precision. This is not very glamorous, and it will be a lot of work like doing tests and fixing things and being sure not to add any subtle bugs, but this is very important. I'm not sure if Alex, who is doing that, really volunteered for that or if he was kind of voluntold, um, but he, somebody had to tackle that, so he's doing that now. Um, Communication is open and public, so everything is basically through a mailing list. So everybody can join any discussion, and everybody can see everybody else's calendar and join, um, which might sound like a good thing, for example, for the emails, but for example, my experience was I joined Elastic. My first working day was on a Friday, and I got my email credentials um, on the Thursday afternoon, and I thought, well, I'm new. Nobody knows me. Um, there will be zero emails in my inbox. I opened Gmail, and I think I had seven or 800 emails in the afternoon, and at midnight I was at 1,000. And that is because you just get everything. You're pretty much on every developer mailing list. You get every failed build. Um, you will need to filter a lot. Um, this is what a calendar looks like. Um, so if you want to do calls, you could just basically do calls the entire day and not do anything else. Um, I'm very careful which calls to join because for me it always feels like a huge time sink. Uh, but some people just like to kind of do cross-team calls. And that's okay. Some colleagues like to just hang around in calls and do other work on the side and just like listen in if something pops up that might be interesting for you. Um, I don't like that. I'm very selective with meetings. But if you like meetings, um, we have plenty of those. Um, New products join the family. That is also something that happens. Like every six to 12 months, I think, we buy some new company. And then it just joins the family. And sometimes these companies are very monolithic or they are used to being in one office. But we kind of managed to break out uh, those like very central hubs as well. Because oftentimes, like the, the leads of those companies actually wanted to move somewhere else. They just never could because, well, their company was in one place. So for example, we bought a machine learning company and their tech lead, Stephen, uh, he was living in London, but um, I think his family or something like that is living in Amsterdam. So very quickly, he moved to Amsterdam. And that helps very easily like break up this one place where everybody is. Uh, if you can kind of like get the team leads uh, out of the company and move somewhere else because then the entire company communication will follow. Um, we've done the same for an APM company that we've, re we've recently bought. Everybody was in Copenhagen, uh, but their tech lead has been living in Berlin for a year now. So that is how, we jo how they join and then kind of get into the right mindset and process. Um, there are downsides. Like I don't want to say like, oh, everything is great if you work in a distributed system or in a distributed company. Um, Time zones are a thing, and time zones are a pain in the ass. Um, for example, um, our team is very distributed, and we have a call every two weeks. And we alternate between time zones. For example, um, we have the call at 5 p.m. European time every four weeks, which is fine for me. But we also have a call at 6 a.m., which is definitely not fine for me. Um, but it's still... I will still join because, well, if you have two continents, you can normally schedule something that would work out for everybody. If you have just Asia and just Europe, that's fine. Or if you have Europe and the US, it will work. But if you have Asia, Europe, and the US, somebody will have to suffer. And since we have most people in Europe and the US, oftentimes we made the people in Asia suffer. So they had the calls at 3 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m., whatever. Um, and, well, they accepted it because they were not the majority, but in the end, it was not a great feeling for them. And they're very happy if we can make calls that they're good for them as well. Um, and somebody else has to suffer a bit. Also for calls, don't feel obliged to join calls just because they're happening. Um, there are always recordings. Um, you can also, if you have something important to discuss, you can also send somebody else or say, somebody else, please take that up for me. Otherwise, it's just not working. Um, because you cannot... You cannot work the entire day and then do a call at 2 a.m. or something like that. That's not going to work in the long run. You just need to accept that there are pains around time zones, and you need to find a solution that works for everybody. Um, communication can fail. Um, 
I guess everybody who has used Twitter once knows how, what I mean, that people are very nice in person, but as soon as it's online and kind of like, even if you show your own name and even if you know the other people, arguments can get very heated and there's kind of like no rationale anymore. Like people will just go crazy over the internet. And we've had that as well, where people were commenting publicly on GitHub, for example, no, this is all shit what you're doing. I will revert your commits. And like, it can get very ugly. Um, and you just need to accept that and work on that, that communication can fail. Um, cultures are different, like I said. Um, what might be a good joke somewhere might be offensive somewhere else, and you just need to err a bit on the side of caution, uh, because normally who defines what is um, offensive is the one who is being offended and not who is making the joke. So show some restraint, um, otherwise somebody else might feel bad. Um, Something that we have found out is that decisions can drag because it's very easy if you put everybody in one room and say, you don't leave before you have come to a conclusion here. Um, since we're not in one place, we cannot put everybody in a room. And somebody in the middle of the call will say, oh, I have to pick up my kids now or I need to make dinner for the family or I don't know, I have some other important appointment and people will leave the call. And then at some point, you're not able to make that decision at that point and then you say, okay, We'll meet next week again, uh, let's see. And then sometimes decisions can drag on and on and on. So if you lock everybody in one room, it can have advantages, um, but it is a pain point that we accept. Um, how does a day in a company look like? Um, my days, I would always say, are more on the crazy side since I'm mostly doing conferences and meetups. Um, I'm doing, I don't know, four different cities this week. So it's just like, okay, you go somewhere, there is no... no fixed schedule or anything. It's just like, whatever works out for me. But I'm definitely not the norm. Um, some people really like their flexible schedules. So they have young kids, for example, and then they take the kids, like maybe they work for an hour at home. Then they take the kids to kindergarten or school. Then they work in a coffee shop close to the school. Then they bring their kids back home, make lunch, uh, work a bit more in the afternoon, then play with their kids, make dinner or whatever, and work a bit more uh, at night. It's kind of like very spread out, but they really like it that they can spend time with the family. Um, other people have a very traditional schedule. So some people just work from, I don't know, in Germany it's probably 7.30 to 5 or something like that. In other countries it's more like 9 or 10 to a later time. Um, I'm also like the, my late schedule, if I can. Uh, some people like to work from home. Others really cannot do that and need to go to a co-working space, which we will cover as well. Like I think up to $500 or something like that per month you can spend on co-working spaces if that is something you need. Um, tools. Oftentimes people ask like, okay, what are the tools that you're using? Um, for synchronous communication, it's pretty much Slack. Who is using Slack? I guess at some point I should ask who is not using Slack. Um, so we use a lot of Slack, too much Slack, and then we use Zoom. Zoom is like a video chat application. It's a bit like Skype or whatever. The nice thing about Zoom is that it really scales. So we can do calls with four or 500 people in one call, and everybody can just raise their hand and then speak. Um, you need to mute everybody else because otherwise there's too much background noise. Uh, but it's, you can have a call with hundreds of people, and whoever wants to can actively participate and share their screen, speak, uh, show their video, whatever. Uh, this is what we use for synchronous communication. Um, Videos are always recorded, um, so anybody who missed out on a call um, can watch later on. For asynchronous communication, well, engineering is mostly GitHub, of course, and then lots and lots and lots and lots of email. Um, way too much email. My, my favorite feature, by the way, is um, filtering emails. Um, this is what keeps my sanity. Otherwise, there is no way to keep track of who is doing what. Um, an hour invested into your filtering rules will save you hundreds of hours of email reading probably later on. Um, we have the structure of team and tech leads per product. Um, who do you guess is the team lead and who do you think is the tech lead? Obviously, left is the team lead, right is the tech lead. Um, but Simon can also smile. He's the, the tech lead for Elasticsearch. Um, we have this structure that somebody is kind of driving the, the technological decisions and somebody else is taking mostly care of like the team. What do you want to develop? What, what are your issues? Um, how can we make you or enable you to work better? And the other one is taking ca more care of the technology side. Mostly you or oftentimes you have people who fit into either one of these roles very naturally. Um, and for us, it always felt like a very good split. Um, we also have, we had a product team for quite some time we have now removed the product team. 
Because product team for us always felt weird. Basically, the product managers are now part of engineering. So there is the tech lead, the team lead, and the product lead for every team now. And it feels much more natural to have them in one structure than have this dedicated product team, um, which will tell the engineers, um, do this feature. For us, this has never worked. Um, our product leads were always um, kind of like, weak is probably the wrong word, but engineering had always a very strong say in what are the features they want to work on and push. Product team like, would filter out, like, okay, these are common things we see, this is what people need. Uh, this is like, okay, product-wise, this would make a lot of sense. But in the end, the engineers still had a lot of say in that process of what is being done. And now, since they're all in one structure, um, it's probably even easier. And we don't believe in having this dedicated product team, which will just tell the stupid engineers what to implement, is a good approach. So for us, it makes a lot of sense to not have a product team. Hiring. Um, we have a lot of HR people internally by now because, um, yeah, we get a lot of CVs. For us, one of the most important features is not hard um, or soft skill, but technical versus professional. Especially if you're in a distributed company, being able to com communicate well is one of the most important features. Of course, we, we require like, very good tech skills, but if you cannot communicate and cooperate with others over a distributed uh, network, it's not going to work out well. You need to have the right people skills, especially if you're not in one office to make that work. Um, these are just attributes. Like, we really don't care normally where you're from. Um, there are some minor limitations. For example, I don't think we can hire very easily in Russia because we have U.S. governmental contracts, and then you cannot do, like, core things in Russia. Um, so there are some contract limitations, but generally for engineering, we really don't care where you are. We have people who... Um, always want to have summer, so they're changing northern and southern hemisphere depending on the time of the year. We have people who are traveling the world. So we had people from Norway, um, and in winter it's always dark, it's very expensive, and well, they started to travel the world. So I think they went from Norway to Malta, and then somewhere in Asia, and then they did some Asian countries, then they went to California, afterwards Hawaii, and they stayed like two or three months in one place and got like the proper Airbnb. They figured out what is important, like having a kitchen, good restaurants, and internet, I think were the three core things they wanted. Um, and they just started to travel around the world. And for them, that's fine. Um, of course, we have some positions which require a specific time zone or language. For example, um, if you're doing support, People expect support times, especially during business hours, to work. Or they expect you to answer in a specific language sometimes. If you're a site reliability engineer, you need to work specific shifts. And most people want to work while the sun is up. So some positions do require a specific location um, or a specific language. But for core products, normally we don't really care where you are. Like we have people in some little town somewhere in the nowhere of France who are Lucene core committers. That's a great fit for us. Uh, and they're very happy to stay wherever they are and their family is. Um, and everything else is then just an attribute. Like, if you do the right thing and you can co cooperate with the team well, that's where we want you. Um, I think we're getting a, around 1,000 or more CVs per week by now, which our recruiters will go through. Um, so that is a lot of people who are kind of churning through the system. Um, we don't like bullshit interviews. It's like, how many golf balls do fit into a jumbo jet? It's nothing we would ask. Um, we, we want more like tangible skills. And the good thing is, if you're an open source product, oftentimes you have open source contributors to your software. And then you know, okay, you can communicate well with them. They are doing the right tech stuff. Then hiring is, of course, much easier. However, since we have this distributed nature of our company, hiring can sometimes take time. Because we cannot just fly you in and do a day of interviews with eight people. That doesn't work. Normally what happens is you do one call, um, then that person says like, okay, go ahead or stop, and then you schedule the call with another person. So normally you do around one interview per week, and we have six to eight or so stages. So it can take up to two months until you're finally hired. That was sometimes a pain point because good people were hired by somebody else quicker, uh, but that's still how we um, work out for that. Um, this is how much we've grown. So from five to 600 people, it took us five months. Six to 700, three months, and seven to 800, two months. Um, I think now that we are about to reach summer, uh, we'll hit 900, have hit, or will hit very soon, I think. Um, in summer, it might slow down a bit, but fall will be very fast again, I guess. Um, so you can see we're hiring 40, 50 people a month by now. Okay. Often people ask, uh, 
show me the numbers that distributed teams are much more successful or better. Um, and I'm always like, yeah, numbers are kind of hard. Um, you can always make up numbers. Um, so here, like Dilbert shows you, um, you can show that whatever studies are better, like 87, that's the right number. And I could make up some number now and say, okay, this is why distributed teams will work best. Um, we don't have these numbers, and I think there are no good numbers for that. We have an indicator. Um, the one indicator that I want to show is, like in one of the previous quarters, we had 130 people joined and nine left. And as long as we have this ratio, we think we're on the right path. If that ratio changes, then we will need to reconsider. Um, to wrap up, um, this was when I ran this talk previously, um, somebody drew that, which was very nice. Um, you can see this was like a month or two ago, so we were only 850 people by then. Uh, but this pretty much describes of what we have. So um, most of the stuff that we have shown, like onboarding, always on, cross-team time, release parties, um, there's no process, it's just whatever makes sense. Do the right thing, uh, that is what somebody drew. This is the first page, there's a second page um, about tools, uh, where the company a logo comes from, etc. Um, that was a very nice conclusion. Um, who still wants to work from an office? That is a legitimate choice. Who wants to work from home now? Okay. Um, for me personally, I feel like going back will be very hard. Like going to the office every day, um, I cannot really imagine that. Like maybe it will change at some point, but right now I have a very hard time imagining that. Um, of course, we are hiring. If anybody is interested, ask me afterwards or check out the open positions. Um, we have pretty much any technology or anything and anywhere. Um, we do have some people in Poland as well now. Um, any questions? So we have around eight minutes left. Anybody have a question? Yes, please. Maybe we can have some light. Thank you. Oh, by the way, bef before I um, start taking questions, I always take a picture because my colleagues don't know where I am. Um, you know, since we're a distributed company, it's okay to be wherever you are. Smile. Um, and this side as well. Thank you. Questions, please. Okay, the question was, how big is a team, basically? Um, uh, and team ownership. So, um, we don't have this, like, you know, there, there's this pizza team size, like how many people can eat this huge uh, Chicago-sized pizza or whatever. We don't really have that. Um, for us, normally, um, so we have a team that is, for example, called Elasticsearch. And then by now we have 40, 45, something like that, people in Elasticsearch. But then that will be split up into subgroups. So for example, we have a, a couple of Lucene core com committers. And then we have somebody who is working on search and somebody who's working on a distributed nature. And admittedly, that changes very frequently. Um, it changes, A, because we have like one big push for something that needs more people. For example, um, the distributed protocol that we have, which is called Send Discover, is currently being re rewritten for and will be called Send2. Um, so there are people working on that. But once that is done, they will be kind of reassigned. Also new people will join, or somebody will leave, or somebody wants to do something else. We're also pretty liquid about teams. We had people do support, move to uh, pre-sales, move to DevRel. Uh, we had solution architects move to development. So it's very liquid wherever you are, because people kind of burned out is kind of a I don't really like the term, but people get tired of something. If you're working for three years on something, you might want to do something else, or your interest changes. So it's not very structured. We don't have like, okay, this is the structure, and this is how we keep it. Um, we're actually experimenting a lot, also because the company just grows everywhere, and sometimes structures work, or they don't work anymore. And what used to work with 400 people two years ago um, doesn't work today anymore. So you need to kind of be flexible. For example, I'm in in the kind of the fourth team, even though I have done the same thing every time. I was hired by a dedicated DevRel team. A week before um, I joined the company, my team lead called me and said, we need to talk. And I was like, hmm, did I do anything wrong? I haven't even joined the company yet. That's kind of weird. And then he said like, oh, I want to become a developer again. Um, I'm joining the Kibana team. And we don't have a team lead for the team now. We're splitting you up. You can pick an engineering team which you join now. Um, and in the end, I ended up in the infrastructure team who had not interviewed me, who didn't know me. And I'm like, okay, first day, here I am. Um, let's, let's do something. 
Um, afterwards, it was decided, okay, we want to have a dedicated DevRel team again. We'll put you into the product team. And then uh, we had a DevRel team and a product team. A month ago or so, it was decided we don't want the product team anymore. Um, and we were split out again. And now we have a dedicated DevRel team in engineering. And I'm not sure where I will be in the company in a year. Um, it's just like moving around and doing the right thing. You, like you said, progress over perfection. Like there is no, okay, this team, this is the team size. Uh, once you hit one person more, we need to split up the team. Um, it's just figure out, for example, uh, language clients. Oftentimes we didn't, or for a long time, the language clients were just somebody's side projects. By now we have a dedicated language team. So the drivers for Java, .NET, Ruby, Python, whatever, they're a dedicated team now to work on that and push for that. But before, for example, the Java driver was just done by the Elasticsearch team. And somebody did the Python driver on the side and the PHP driver and whatever. So it just changes. Um, it might not be a great answer, um, but for us, like process is not a big thing. Uh, figure out what is right and do the right thing, I'm afraid. Yes, please. Do people get fired? Do people get fired? Um, yes, uh, it is. American company culture, um, people will get fired for serious offenses. Uh, what have one has to do to be fired? Hmm. Uh, this is an interesting question uh, on the record now, uh, since we have the video. Um, so <laughs> I think there are two things normally. Um, one thing is um, if there's kind of like somebody uh, just does not cooperate well with others. And it's like, okay, either this one person who is abusing others leaves or five other people will leave. And then yet there needs to be a decision. And even if you're technically very good, um, if you're kind of harassing other people, there's just no way to keep you around because we value the company culture. And harassing is just, don't go there. The other thing is sometimes uh, people will just um, have problems with either their team lead or they, they get bored at work and they don't do that much work. Since we're fully distributed, um, once or twice it happened that people basically disappeared. They didn't... Well, nobody sees you in the office. It's just like, you didn't commit anything in the last month. What's up? And people kind of just disappear. Um, uh, no, no, no. We, we make sure that people are still alive. Um, but sometimes um, it can happen. It's like in the office, um, it's not a good metric that somebody shows up in the office because they might just be slacking off in the office, but you say, okay, he's sitting in his chair, um, he's physically present, so okay, that's okay. For us, it's more result-driven. Um, and yeah, it happened that people just disappear. I think that sooner or later, if you have hundreds of people, it's kind of like, it will happen. Um, and at some point, somebody needs to make a decision and figure out what will be the way forward. Yeah, um, and it's, since it's kind of a bit of an American company culture, firing is, can be very quick. Like, sometimes you get this email like, person X's last day is tomorrow. Um, yes, you, you don't have to do the walk of shame out um, because you're just staying at home. Uh, you don't need to walk out with some bag of something. Uh, no, we don't have that. Quick final question, anybody? Yes, please. How easy is it to change the team? Um, pretty easy. Um, it happens more often that somebody changes the team than somebody leaves the company. Um, because people they develop new interests or, for example, some roles require a lot of travel and people get tired of traveling because, well, they get kids. And then you just need to change that. For example, the trainers who are always on the road and travel, some of them one of them got a kid, and then now he's doing like different things. Or one of the pre-sales engineers who was always traveling, he is now a developer for Logstash. Um, people move to all different things. Normally, like sales and engineering doesn't change that much, but within engineering, we're very flexible. Like we had people on Logstash move to uh, Elasticsearch, uh, or somebody from uh, with JRuby background moving to Go. And as long as you're kind of like able to do the work we're very happy to move you within the company then lose somebody. Um, so generally that's, that's easy. Um, you just need to talk to the people and figure out where you want to go. Um, okay, we have 20 uh, seconds left. I don't think we can do another question. If you want to have stickers, I have a bunch of stickers here. Grab them. Otherwise, thanks a lot. <laughs>